There will be a quiz on the FinFit and protocol at the end of this lecture. And I expected to appear in a call for papers, as well as a program guide and other paperwork by each and every neighbor here. If not, I will find you, I will hunt you down, and I will say, fuck you, neighbor. And you will say? Fuck you, neighbor. There we go. Um, so today's lecture is a new one. The idea is that uh, for the past year, I've been building a debugger of my own called the GoodFet. And there are certain vulnerabilities that I've found only because I've written a debugger from scratch. So the bulk of this lecture will be showing you in depth how debuggers work and how the different protocols vary. Uh, JTAG is the most famous one, but every chip has its own little quirks to it and its own spin on the debugging protocol. You have uh, three that will be discussed in this lecture. I'll be discussing the MSP430's JTAG debugging protocol as well as the Chipcon 2430's uh, 8051 ser synchronous serial protocol and another one for the Atmel at Tiny's. Is the echo bothering anyone else or just me? Okay. Uh, so this is a TV Begone. Whoa. Okay. This is a TV Begone by... Hello? Is it this microphone reacting with... I don't know. Um, yeah, so this is the At Tiny 85 in the TV Begone kit by Mitch Altman and Lady Ada. And is there a laser pointer I could use? All right. So the, up here on the right, you see the six pin port labeled ICSP? That's actually used for programming the chip. So if you buy this as a blank board and you populate it with your own parts, you have to also add a six pin header and then flash in your own code to it. This is the EZ430 by Texas Instruments. It is a debugger, but it can also be debugged itself. The five pins that I've brought out at the top can be used to reflash the MSP430, which is on the bottom of this board, allowing you to run new debugging software on the board itself. Last year at Congress, I presented a lecture on reverse engineering this board with the aim of writing a new application to run inside of it. In doing so, I got so fed up with the board itself that I wrote new um, software and hardware for it, and I'm able to do a complete replacement. The code, however, can also run on this board with proper patching. Here we have um, an unfinished project of mine. It's the GUSK-10. This is a replacement cartridge for the Sega Genesis and also the Nomad. I think it's called the Master System here, uh, or Mega Drive. Um, so this sticks into the cartridge slot and it has an SRAM chip that it flashes before booting with a given game image. And then when you turn your game system on, you have whatever ROM image was loaded. If any of you are familiar with the Sega Genesis copy protection system, uh, it's worth studying. It's based upon trademarks, not copyright law. So when they're trying to force all of their vendors to use like, their proper licensing and do it in the Sega style cartridge, Instead of having a proprietary library that they had to load or a copy protection chip as Nintendo did, they actually just put their name in memory at a particular address, S-E-G-A, in ASCII. If that exists in memory, then the cartridge is valid. And they thought that they could enforce this with trademark law. <laughs> this did not stand up in the American courts. I'm not sure how it worked in Germany. Um, my other project from Congress last year, and yet one more thing that can be debugged, is uh, the BSL cracker itself. This connects to a JTAG debugger on the left, and on the right it connects to a uh, target chip's serial port. And then it runs the serial bootloader on the target device, changing its guess of a password, looking for a two clock cycle difference, which is actually magnified by a difference in the clock rates of the chips. Uh, but this can crack the password of an MSP430 one byte at a time, and it can narrow it down on it just like in the game Mastermind. Oops. This here is an IPv6 computer that also includes a radio. It's on a single chip. This is the board in my hand. If you can't see it, that's the point. These are wireless sensor networks. So you can purchase 100 of these. You can slap lithium batteries on them with proper power management. You throw them out in the wild and they'll run for a year unattended. 
This is a development kit from Texas Instruments that actually has two different chips on it. There is the 20-bit MSP430 F22, oh, sorry, F427 here above the four on the left, the big chip. And that is the upper JTAG port on the left. The bottom JTAG port on the left has a smaller chip to the right of it. And that's actually spy-by-wire, which is a variant of four-wire JTAG that we'll discuss briefly. Um, the reason why you want to be able to uh, debugger for all of these things is so that you can speak to them yourself without having a library or a product in between you and the device itself. If you have, say, a test environment working on your workbench, you have your gizmo, you can run your test case on your debugger, and you know that this device works. That's great in development, but as soon as you need to deploy that device and you need to run these test cases on the assembly line, you find yourself having to take your same Windows workstation, because the software isn't available for Mac, and it's not updated for Linux, and you have to stick it on the assembly line, and if it goes down, if it chugs up for an update, if it locks up for any reason, the assembly line stops and your product stops moving. And that's not acceptable. So in that regard, from a production standpoint, it's valuable to be able to have your own debugging code that you can put into your own device to flash the device yourself. You could make a handheld device with the, what I cover in this lecture as well as the code online, which flashes a chip on a single button press. And then you could sit there on the assembly line and you could hit each unit, push the button, flash the firmware in, test it, and move on to the next. If you had 100 devices to flash, you could do this in a fraction of the time that the uh, PC debugger would allow you to do it. Because you don't have to keep the window open and keep clicking on the button and all of that stuff. You can automate it. It's also valuable because you can start attacking these devices through their own debugging protocols. They will speak the debugging protocols even in their locked state, and you can sort of trick them into letting you go further than you're supposed to. So in last year's slides, uh, I actually had two talks at Congress. The first was on repurposing the EZ430. The concept here is that you could take an existing TI debugger and you could reverse engineer just enough of its firmware to know where to place the hooks, to know which port does what, to know how the clocks work, how the timing worked. And uh, eventually, you could also use this information to build new hardware for the same firmware. And in articles since, which you'll find on the blog, I showed how to extract that firmware from the driver itself. So if all you want is the TI debugger, you can get that and you can manufacture that yourself. And the protocol that it speaks to the PC has even been reverse engineered by myself and two other groups. One of which beat me to it. In my second lecture, I attacked a different debugging protocol of the MSP430. Could someone bring me a mate? The beer doesn't work on stage. Won't stop me from trying. <laughs> oh, thank you, shooting neighbor. Ah, mate. Mm. Cheers for the mate. And for all that. Um. <coughs> so my second lecture centered around extracting firmware from a chip. If you have a microcontroller and it has a program in it, but the microcontroller is locked, how do you get it out? The method I demonstrated was by uh, timing attack against the MSP430 bootloader. Ugh. Forgive my throat. Um, and also the use of voltage glitching to skip a single instruction within that bootloader. So if the bootloader itself were to be disabled, you can skip around that by jumping, uh, by skipping out of a self-referential jump. There would be a jump if zero plus zero instruction, which replaces the program counter with its old value at the end of execution. This requires two clock cycles on four clock edges to execute. And if uh, two of those clock edges are skipped, you sort of fall into the next instruction and keep executing. And the next instruction is where you would go if the comparison went the other way. They don't do any buffering, so if you skip this one instruction, you can fall through. Uh, this is the EZ4 that 